So um, welcome to all of you. Uh, thanks for having me. It's wonderful to see all of you. I don't see all of you, but I thought I'd start off with a question um, for those of you who are appearing on screen and wanted to see who, you know, asked the question, how you define the difference between um, architect and designer. And I was just wondering if anyone had those thoughts or could do that. Anyone? I think that I would turn, not to put her on the spot, Julia, uh. <laughs> whose dad is an architect and she chose to go into design and her um, boyfriend's also an architect. Ah. Yeah, well, I can't escape it. I'm essentially marrying my father. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like the biggest thing is for me and what I've noticed is personality type because I am very extroverted and I've noticed that with all of the architects in my life, they're all very introverted. Um, and I think it's, it's a very specific way of thinking that you capture more one-on-one -on -one than in a group, or at least I think they're more comfortable sharing their thoughts one-on-one. -on -one. It's far more intellectual, I feel, than interiors in a way, because interiors, you're so much studying someone's personality <laughs> and you really have to get in there with therapy and understand them and I think with architecture it's a little bit different but I would say like the biggest thing for me is the difference in personalities <laughs> that's very astute that's really interesting never thought of that huh anyone else no I do notice that architecture they do have like a more clinical approach to it where interiors, there are different types of people in interiors. So I always feel like the, the person who owns the firm has three attributes and it's charisma, it's aesthetic, and then it's business. And so for us, I always build in to the, the deficit of those attributes. You have to have all three, but then there's always one that stands out. And so whatever you have, I try to build a team that builds into the other two attributes. That's fascinating. See, I, I, I came from a very, um, I was sort of analyzing it, but I think, and those are all really interesting points. And I think that's really great to have that perspective. Um, thank you for sharing all that. That's really cool. Uh, I learned something and um, I'm going to put on shared screen. So, I'm glad we opened with that because um, that's something that I learned. Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. So um, I thought that would be a really nice way to start our discussion. Um, and for me, this is a discussion. Um, I don't have a lot of public speaking experience. Maybe I'm, as Julia, um, the ha half of me is the introvert side, the architect. <laughs> um, but I thought it'd be really good to hear that, hear your, hear your thoughts. I don't know if I could really give you a definition myself um, between architect and des designer. Um, and so I think I thought it was good to start with this because as you guys are maybe trying to find your path in this industry and also for your work, marketing and PR, or whether you want to go into studio practice, that it's really maybe important for you at least to define the terms in your own words. Um, I do know that uh, there's a, the understanding of architect is codified. So not everyone can call themselves architect. Um, mostly anyone can call themselves a designer. The title of architect is uh, protected like other professions that serve in the public interest, such as lawyers and doctors. Um, and curiously though, in California, you don't need to be a licensed architect uh, if you're working on a residential structure that's wood frame and that's less than two stories. Uh, and I think maybe because I'm most interested in those residential projects that I find it really hard to define the differences. Um, I will say I have a master's degree in architecture um, and I design, but I really couldn't give you much more. <laughs> uh, so I think, you know, speaking to Krista's um, uh, point about inspire and inspiration, 
I was trying to figure out really how would I describe point to where I am now. And I guess I would say that, you know, it's always been about finding answers through a process of trial and error. Um, <clears throat> and um, I guess that process, I guess it's very hard to understand uh, being, uh, doing that experience and finding your path. Um, but I've always found intuition and judgment as my tools. Um, I think also being open to the possibility uh, has brought on maybe uh, the idea of luck, uh, which I also think is um, not discussed very much as a contribution to someone's success. So um, just that path of being open and trying trial and error is how I think I, I've always thought of uh, my journey so far. Um, I grew up in Oakland in the Bay Area. I am a product of the Oakland public school system. And um, growing up in the suburbs of Oakland, I always wanted to move away for college, but I ended up going to Berkeley in the end. So I didn't go very far. Um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to go into. And um, uh, ending up in architecture was almost a matter of trial and error. I tried uh, cultural anthropology. I was very pragmatic and thought because I wore glasses since I was 12, I'd do something and try and go into optometry. Um, I was good at math, so I thought structural engineering. But in the end, I ended up taking a survey course uh, by an architect named Lars Larup. He later on became the Dean of Architecture at Rice University. But during this survey course, there was an announcement for anyone interested in taking a second semester studio um, without taking the first semester, um, anyone interested could sign up because there were openings. So I thought I would just try and see. I tried all these other things and um, it was about trial and error. And I ended up enjoying it. I enjoyed the theory, the, um, the creative part, uh, the history, and also the social part, you know, meeting people in that department, um, getting to know uh, the community there. So I think you could say it was a matter of trial and error, ending up in architecture in that way. Um, so I had 10 degrees before I graduated, 10, <laughs> not degrees, 10 majors yeah. before I graduated. And I was going to, you needed 128 credits to graduate. Graduate. I had 156. <laughs> <laughs> and my stepdad gave me an ultimatum. He was like, pick a major and get out of school. <laughs> I think we call that uh, the five-year program, right? <laughs> oh, mine was seven. And then I moved out to the Bay Area, like right before the economy crashed. And I was like six credits shy. Oh. And my mother was horrified. But I started like, I started one company before I got my credits to graduate. Exactly. Trial and error, right? <laughs> Just, well, we call it, we, well, we're going to reframe it. We're going to call it entrepreneurial ship. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Maybe in your case, <laughs> I, working with you. I definitely don't have that side. <laughs> but I mean, who knows where the path takes you, right? Exactly. 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 I, I say life is like a game of golf. You just have to play the course. Sometimes you're like underwater. Sometimes you're in the bunkers and sometimes you're like a hole in one. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, to that point, though, I mean, just um, playing the chorus, um, even like when I finished school, um, San Francisco, in San Francisco, the Bay Area, there was a recession, I think, even, even in California, where there were really no jobs. So to get experience, you know, I freelanced and I volunteered at different offices. Um, one of them was at the office of Stanley Sadowitz. Um, I uh, worked for an interior designer named Glenn Reynolds who worked mm -hmm. in the office of um, Sandy Walker, of uh, Walker Moody. So we uh, picked up projects with Walker Moody. Um, I also volunteered at nonprofit organizations, uh, one called the Asian Neighborhood Design, which is still around, I think. And um, one that did tenant improvements for the Tenderloin neighborhood design community uh, or design corporation. Um, 
so it's just a matter of like getting experience and just getting out there. I will say, you know, part of the idea of trial and error, but also being open to chance and opportunity. That's also the time where I met my my spouse, my current spouse. Uh, he's Dutch, and at that point, <clears throat> I thought, um, you know, given the circumstances given that I always wanted to move away and live away, I thought maybe Europe, I thought maybe France, Paris, I could communicate with high school and college French. Um, I was, you know, had that uh, interest um, in another culture, in their culture, um, but I had no idea about the Netherlands. So uh, what was the Netherlands? You know, it was not on my radar, um, but we met and I moved there. And I took a, um, a, a chance and embraced change. And so I moved abroad. Um, one of the first jobs that I had uh, in the Netherlands was uh, a paid internship at uh, an office. Uh, the architect's name was Herman Herzberger. And here you see his picture from his Instagram post, his most like, very current picture of him. Um, but I didn't really understand once I when I was at in the Netherlands, uh, the culture of architecture with a within a country, you know, one tenth the size of California. Um, it's just one of those countries, which I've learned comes up when people talk about a place where it's where its citizens are one of the most happiest people, uh, you know, uh, groups in the world. Um, and I found myself in a place where there's a very different attitude towards the built environment. Toward, and there's a conversation about social and public spaces, about housing and about art. And so I found it a really, um, really amazing um, pl uh, place to be and a time to be there. Below uh, Herman's picture is um, one of his housing projects. Um, he became, he was really no well known for social architecture. Um, and on the left is one of the last projects I worked on was a competition for a music theater in Breda. Um, and it, it was eventually built, but um, so, and that's a picture that I found on their Instagram post. Um, I, so Callie yeah. has a question for you. Was it yeah. challenging to navigate through the language barrier at the firm you worked in in the Netherlands? Well, um, that's a good question because I think um, one of it was a one it was one of my first experiences uh, at Herman's office, but also made me realize uh, that if I wanted to continue working there and I wanted to do things that I enjoyed or found interesting, I'd have to learn the language. So. I mean, it's a really good question, I think. Um, and after that internship, I uh, went to Columbia, Columbia University in New York. And during that period of three years, I would commute uh, between New York and Amsterdam. Um, and while at, in grad school, I ended up taking undergrad courses in Dutch conversation. Just so I would prepare myself uh, when I finished, because uh, I knew I wanted to end up back in the Netherlands. Uh, at some point after school. Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, along the way, in, during grad school, and with my connection in the Netherlands, you know, uh, meeting people, whether in New York or in Amsterdam, it was an amazing period. And through another job at the Dutch Museum for Architecture in Rotterdam, um, I helped organize a, a summer course there. Uh, one of the curators uh, introduced me to a young up and coming architect. His name was Vinnie Moss. And he, um, he had started a company called MVRDV, MVRDV. He was the Moss, Vinnie Moss of MVRDV. And um, he uh, was a landscape architect and his, I joined the office, I took a semester off from grad school and I worked there as an assistant designer. 
um, with a whole bunch of other international assistant designers. It was actually a really amazing period. So it was really hard work. Um, I, it was about an hour and a half commute each way from Amsterdam to Rotterdam. Um, you know, long hours, uh, you're the first one in, the last one out. But it was uh, really amazing to be there uh, with this uh, principal designer and with all these other people who wanted to be there. Um, one of the last projects I worked on is on the right. Um, and it's the Dutch pavilion at the World Expo in Hanover, which was built in 2000. And this is a collage, a presentation that we worked on. Um, but you can see it's actually built. So if you go online, you can see it. Um, and it's still there. And the intention was that it'd be built and after the expo, it'd be used uh, to attract people. So, you know, uh, it's basically a, um, a stacked landscape, uh, a, a building of stacked Dutch landscapes, I should say. So um, it's like dunes, forests, waterways, um, man-made terrains, and at the top are, are functional windmills that pump the water up and through the whole building. So it's actually really brilliant, I think. And um, it was a period where uh, the whole period was really about questioning what is architecture, right? So, I mean, this is a landscape architect who's building buildings and inside are these um, environments that you experience interior, right? So what is architecture? And I thought that was really um, eye-opening. Um, oh, here you see actually um, Vinny <clears throat> and one of his, uh, he, he's, he's an academics and this is one of his um, quotes to students, never put everything in your graduation project because you will lose yourself. You can do one thing for one project and then the next project you can do another. And I actually, I think that really is applicable to work itself. You never really wanna put everything into one project, but just save, just observe and file it away and you'll find something appropriate um, for that, uh, that idea that you have. I totally agree. One of the discussions we used to have when we were in the office together is not giving away your ingenuity to somebody else. And one of the things that has always bothered me about interior design in particular is that when you're working under a principal or under somebody else, you give away like your you know creative ingenuity and then they take credit for it. So I thought when Tom Ford did Tom Ford for Gucci and they gave him credit, I thought that was brilliant. And I still feel like some progress that we need to do in the interior design sector is giving credit to the creatives who produce it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that was another thing that just as a minor thing, but speaking to what you're saying in the United States, I might be different now, but in architecture, it was really accepted and industry standard to work for free as an intern. And that's just your dues that you have to had to go through. You had to, you know, to get there. I think it's a little different now. You get paid for internships. And um, I think there are offices now that, uh, like at the MVRDV, uh, if you go into publications, they actually give credit uh, to those who worked on the team. In fact, actually, um, while I was there, uh, the work that I, um, the, the projects I was able to work on, that were published in a magazine or a book called El Croquis. You can look that up as well. I don't know if it's the publication still around or even the World Expo. Um, Farmax is another publication that they did. They listed everyone participated and I got my name in those. So it was actually really awesome. And I was in, you know, an assistant designer. So yes, I totally agree with that. It's, it's just um, eye-opening that there are other possibilities, right? Keeping your- yeah your possibilities open. Yeah, and don't give away your best work. Do your best work for yourself. I think there's platforms that you can put it on like Pinterest and other ways that you can promote yourself. Yes. But handing over your ingenuity to somebody else is, I just, I don't think it's a good bargain. Exactly, agreed, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, along the way, um, after finishing grad school, after that experience, at MVRTV. I knew I wanted to end up back in the Netherlands, but I also wanted to be 
closer, I wanted to be in Amsterdam. Um, most of the interesting offices were in Rotterdam. I just didn't want to do that commute anymore. And I think Amsterdam is an incredible city. So if none of you have been there, um, that should be on your list. It's a great city. Um, but I did come, you know, did work my way through different offices. One of them was uh, with this amazing um, person. Her name is Trude Hoikas, um, a lady in a men's profession still, I think. Um, but she built buildings. She designed in interiors. Um, you know, the building on the right is a building um, that was being designed when I was there, but it's now a part of the, the Amsterdam skyline in the north part of the city. It's on the water. It's um, a building on top of a uh, terrain that was used for building ships. Um, just actually absolutely amazing. The building on the left is for the department of, um, what is that? Education, culture, and science, um, the Ministry for uh, OCMV. It was at the time designed by an American architecture office, uh, KPF, Cone Peterson Fox. And Truda uh, was responsible for all of the interiors. She did banks, she did ministry buildings. She's very well known. And um, actually, to the person's question, um, about language at that point, it was a wonderful experience because I got to touch test my Dutch skills. I was um, I was working on the interiors. Um, I was responsible for the um, putting together the furnishings, <clears throat> uh, the presentations, um, and also coordinating with the uh, committee for the government that was overseeing this, this um, the, the interior design part. So it was a lot of communication um, with the people there in Dutch and with um, the team in the office. Uh, they all spoke English, but um, it's actually a really good test of, of and using, and using my, my skills uh, in Dutch. So, um, you know, I worked on a team, but this was, I, I put it at the, this in there just because it was part of, um, integrating and understanding the, the culture as part of what you're doing. And so, you know, learning, knowing a second language and living in that environment, I, I was just an in... um, Along the way, you know, by chance, I met a, um, a person, a man named Mark Yon. He's an antique, an art dealer, actually. He's a now currently an art advisor. And um, I got to know him because my brother bought some Japanese prints from him. But um, he ended up working for another dealer who had an architecture, interior, arts and antiques business. So it was all under one umbrella. And that man, um, his name is Anna Paul Brinkman. There he is on the right. Um, he now is in real estate, according to his uh, Instagram post. And the building on the left, uh, the buildings on the left, the center one, this one, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the center one is uh, what I know as my office for some time on the third floor, looking out over the canal, a 17th century building that was restored by Anna Paul. Um, he lived in the carriage house in the back. And the office was this whole front structure. Um, just amazing, um, the environment to be there, to work there. And this is actually before Ken Folk, um, though the business model was similar, um, is an office that uh, built homes, um, restored homes, designed interiors and furniture, um, but also uh, after the projects were completed, clients could decide that some years later, if they wanted to get new antiques and art, they could return it. Uh, Anna Paul would take it back into inventory and allow them to exchange it with other things in his inventory, which I thought was really smart. They would call him for, um, for maintenance. So there was a whole maintenance crew that was part of the company um, and also for entertaining. There was he had a, a whole kitchen of people and staff 
uh, actually that was a, one of the perks of working there because our lunches um, so the Dutch actually uh, the one hour a day actually two two times a day I have to say maybe three no let's say three times three times a day uh, you might be intensely engrossed in your work but three times a day as a community as an office you gather and you actually are together so at 10 o'clock you have coffee you sit down for a 15 minute break you'll all gather and you'll have coffee or tea together uh, then there's a one hour break for lunch and um, that's where everyone's sitting together and having lunch and then the afternoon I think around three or four you'll have coffee or tea very proper but um, the perk at this office was that the whole kitchen staff was making everything and we'd sit in this 17th century house in the proper dining room and we'd all be there having our lunch and it was incredible right so um just one of those experiences you remember uh and uh, it's just also a really great perspective to understand how the the mix of architecture interior design antiques and art could be all under one umbrella so you know what is architecture what is interior design what is design um, in 2005, we came back to the Bay Area and by chance, well, not well by chance, I came across Hedge. I was reacquainting myself with San Francisco. Um, I came across a gallery called Hedge, which was owned by Stephen Volpe. Uh, the gallerist, Laura Piccini, she and I started talking. They had beautiful product, things that I thought, wow, this is an amazing store. She said, why don't you apply for Stephen Volpe? They could use another person. And so I applied and I ended up working there. Um, it was a period of growth for Stephen, I think. Uh, it was him um, and a person named John de la Cruz, who you might know, um, he's now on his own. Um, it was Tiffany Ping, who's at Architect AI, uh, architecture interiors company that I think is more national. They have companies, uh, offices, locations everywhere, and myself. And we worked on everything together. We, the office was out of a loft in South of Market. And it was a really interesting period to be there before I think he was on everyone's radar but um, I'm very local. He's still very much in tune with the San Francisco um, high-end residential projects. Um, we worked, I don't know if any of you remember Mervyn's. Um, that was a giant department store. I think um, Merv was his name. I can't remember their last name, but uh, if you look in Diane Sake's book on California style, that's their project on the cover. Um, Andy Skirman did the architecture. Um, he worked for, um, I think his big project was Kordistani um, from Google um, that has really given him a lot of work. Um, but also interesting for me was just being, understanding who was involved in San Francisco. Um, this is one of the projects that we all worked on was the showcase in 2006. I don't know if any of you had been there. Um, our room was right across from Douglas Durkin's room, and I think he was just trying to get started at that point. So, and I can't remember who else was in that house, but um, it was really great just to understand the different offices. So, so Kendall was in that house. Oh, okay. Was she upstairs? She was in the master bedroom. Upstairs, yeah. And then um, Ed Westbrook from Quarry House just redid the house with uh, Suzanne Tucker, Andrew Skirman, and who else, Kendra? It, was it Zatare for the landscape? Zatare wasn't there yet. Yeah, so they did, they redid the house. They, it, the, I forget what they sold it for, but Kendra would know because she's like the super sleuth. But they invested over a hundred million dollars back into that house. That's crazy crazy and so they have like an underground like grotto and it is insane but the um the lady who sold the house that you did in 2006 I don't remember or I don't know if you remember she greeted everybody at the door oh you're right on the opening night for that house you're right and she lived in her childhood bedroom 
the entire time that she owned the house. She stayed in her childhood bedroom. She was like a true like San Francisco eccentric. And I was working for Kindle at the time. And Kindle painted the room teal, like the main master bedroom teal. And then she painted the um, closet orange. And <laughs> I don't and, and the woman came in the, who owned the house and she said, um, my mother is rolling over in her grave right now and her heart is bleeding. Oh no. And then Kendall looked white as a ghost. Oh. <laughs> she came like running back to the office and she's like, we have to repaint the closet. And then it ended up being like a white closet and beautiful. But um, it was like one of the funnier stories, you know, as you know, working for an interior designer, there's like never a dull one. Mm. But that was a beautiful house. That's oh, and a huge and amazing. That's an amazing story. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, I mean, I think, I mean, to the point, you just like this path you take just are these moments of intersection. I mean, you and I and Kendall actually crossed at that point, it seems. And who knew, like 10 years later, our paths would cross again. So it's just these moments of allowing yourself for opportunity and open to chance, um, I think can help, can guide you down the path, even if you're not certain what that 10 year plan is gonna be. Um, so I think it's just really wonderful to, and of course everything is in retrospect, right? I mean, everything you don't realize until later, but um, that's the fun of it, I think also. Um, I mean, I think the last, place I was at, even, you know, I came there because, through Stephen Volpe's office. My colleagues, John had just left for um, Babby Moulton and Tiffany was, uh, I don't know, she went to Hart Howerton and Tiffany um, said, hey, you know, she used to work at the Wiseman Group. There are openings there, you might wanna apply. So I never thought of it. I thought, oh, I'm really enjoying Stephen Volpe, but why not try something and see what happens? So I applied and I had an, um, first an interview, just uh, they had a lot of applications. Um, and second interview, they put me, actually it was a three hour interview. They said, you're gonna design a room. Um, we're gonna do a three hour charrette. You're gonna design a room in two hours. And then you and Paul are gonna sit down and you're gonna present it to Paul. And so that was my test. I uh, went there and they gave me a very specific type of room. I sat in their library for two hours and then he came and we discussed it. And I wasn't sure what his thoughts were after that. It was very nice, but who knew? Um, they said, we'd like you to come. And actually I ended up running a small group there um, and I got to work with Paul directly. So. That was chance, um, I think, I'd like to think. Um, but you also, to your, you're always so humble. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play you up for a minute. Um, you also requested that you only wanted to work under Paul. So as you were curating your career, you were in a power move and you also asked for what you wanted. And I just, true. I, it's very remarkable. That's, a, that's true. I, I, yes, you are absolutely right. Um, I guess, I guess um, part of it is, you know, maybe you might not have the 10 year plan, but you sort of have goals and maybe the goals are not always specific. Maybe they are, maybe, um, yeah, for me in that moment, I knew I'd worked with Stephen Volpe and, you know, it was such a small studio. I had these other experiences uh, in the Netherlands and, um, I figured, okay, if I'm going to try something new, what's it, what is going to be, what's going to make it worthwhile, right? At this point in my life, I'm nothing to lose, but certainly everything to gain. And if I'm going to do it, what's going to be worthwhile? Because I do like Stephen Volpe. I like, I like working there. So I'd only go there if I could work with Paul directly. There was, you know, the other principals were there. Joseph was there, Joseph, Joseph Matzo, James Hunter, and Brenda Mickel, but yeah, only Paul. I mean, so you're right. I did. I did get it there. And in fact, um, 
I worked on so many projects there. Our, our company, our group, we ran anywhere about maybe up to 15 projects at one time. Um, one of them, we ran small, small projects. I mean, they weren't the, um, the super uber large projects that Brenda and James were getting. Of course, I didn't expect that because I was also new and I was being tested, but I got to, I also got pro, uh, Paul's project. Um, I helped him renovate his home in Belvedere. And um, on the right, I think um, Kendra might've been the one who wrote the article um about his home in Belvedere and I think this was one of the images yeah. and on the left for, is for California right? homes yeah exactly exactly mm -hmm. in fact I remember seeing Kendra at the very after our install we were still sort of fluffing the place I think we yeah. just put in the upholstery <laughs> you might have been doing um maybe a preview or just understanding the what was happening and you were there with him I think I remember I was there for the photo shoot oh it was for the photo shoot with Matthew mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yes. So you were there for this image. Yeah. Yeah. I exactly. Was there. exactly. <laughs> and to the left is during our design process and, you know, installing this antique fireplace that Paul had received as a gift from one of his friends and um, the bookshelves uh, that I designed and the paneling. Um, I mean, so it was a really great collaborative effort. Paul has a lot of a sense of his own style, um, but also being part of the process. If you see on the left, there's an image, actually you see it also on the right, um, there's a, an, an opening to the dining room. I remember that one opening, you know, this is a, Paul said, he wrote to me, he, I can't remember if he called me or if he wrote me an email, uh, in an off hour, he was like, you know, should we open this up and get rid of this opening to make the dining room and living room much more open? So, I mean, the fact that he was asking me my opinion, I thought was really wonderful and part of the experience, right? Um, I advised him not to because I thought as if his intention was really to be about the cottage and the history of it, um, opening up was maybe not the best solution because it would feel more contemporary mm -hmm. than an actual cottage, especially if that's what he valued in the space. So we decided to close it, to keep it um, closed. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of been my path. Um, and I guess I would say- I love that story because I really think it speaks to design and that especially during COVID, you can't design in a bubble. It's all about collaboration. And once you have like your trusted advisors, then you can really start to have some fun. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I mean, there's, I think one thing I learned at the Wiseman Group, Paul's a great collaborator. Um, He's and he's a fantastic, he's a fantastic mentor. I've watched him in action and he yes. really enjoys that collaboration and he enjoys the mentorship and the education around it. Yes, absolutely. So I feel really lucky that, you know, I was able to have that relationship. Whereas I think some of my other um, colleagues who came into the office went directly into a, another principal's group, right? And so they didn't have that one-on-one -on -one direct contact that I had that I found, you know, really inspiring. Um, I agree. Um, so Kendra said the cottage may have been designed by Julia Morgan. That's correct, exactly. Which yeah. is like another pioneer, female pioneer within the architecture and design industry. I think if anyone is interested in, in the project, read uh, Kendra's article. Um, I think the house itself has also been very much uh, written about Paul's gotten a lot of publicity. He um, likes to tell the story or um, likes the idea. I don't know if there is, um, I don't know what um, evidence there is, but there's a thought that Julia Morgan um, designed the house on a napkin. In fact, it was for sure one of her friends who I think was a lady doctor or a professional of some sort. So it has a really nice story to it and history to it. Julia Morgan, 
I think is one of those amazing architects who, um, uh, for those of you who are interested, she designed um, Saint Simeon, um, Hearst Castle. So she was, um, and that is a, though it looks like a castle, it's one of the first concrete structures of its time on that scale. So she really ex uh, uh, experimented with material and, um, and using that to architecture, even though it was, you know, she doesn't get a lot of credit because at that time it was also very much a man's world as it still is in architecture. So it's another um, interesting person to look up. Um, and I would say maybe it's also to Julie Morgan's path as well, but my path um, definitely there was no direct route. <laughs> um, I think, you know, after, after Amsterdam and before coming back to the Bay Area, we also lived in Sweden, in Stockholm, uh, Sweden, and we also lived in New York for a while. And so if I look at that trajectory of Oakland to Berkeley, to San Francisco, to Amsterdam, to New York, back to Amsterdam, to Stockholm, to New York, and then to San Francisco, it's definitely you know, been a lot of turns and um, just, um, a lot of possibilities and one that I could never really imagine at the, at the moment or even understand while, while doing it. Um, I think the one great thing about being open to possibilities um, and embracing chance was also um, learning through travel and through living in different places was the experience of discovery, um, things for the first time, um, that experience of things for the first time, and also observing and understanding why, what those experiences meant um, as a, you know, why, why is this an amazing experience? What, um, you know, what, what is it that's fascinating about seeing this for the first time? I mean, those things stick with you, what leaves an impression, I think. And so um, the universal need for shelter, I think is, you know, it, it's, it, there's that universal need, there's, that's a, a human condition, um, but then understanding those creative elements that people use to define their environments, I find really fascinating. And I think starting my uh, Martin Young design in 2012, I try to articulate that in our tag. Um, we're an interior design firm with an architectural point of view. So, um, you know, started off with the question, what's the difference between architect, an architect and a designer? I'm still not sure I can answer that for you, but I think, um, I think that is, uh, taking those references that I've uh, experienced I th and, and, and using it for my work, those have always been um, sort of the heart of what I do. Um, I just wanted to just go through this last part um, sort of fast as examples for you. Um, on the left is our Spanish revival home. I don't know if you guys can see these uh, projects on our website, but you know I'm always looking at scale Scale is really important. And I've always been fascinated with John Dickinson's um, home and his uh, firehouse uh, with his found, uh, what do they call phrenology heads. Um, they're used for um, practice uh, to show you the uh, PowerPoints of the body. Um, you know, I think they'll use it in acupuncture and then um, homeopathy. But um, these heads are just amazing and the use of scale and to draw your eye upward. Um, so I'm always looking at scale um, and things. Um, and the John Dickinson um, firehouse is featured in Diane Sake's book, uh, San Francisco style. I think it was done early 19, I don't wanna say like 1996. Um, it's in the office for anybody who wants to borrow it. Hmm, okay. I think it was done earlier because I think that same firehouse was the house Jerry Brown owned and lived in after, right? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it had changed hands. Oh, didn't um, Trevor? Uh, 
no, uh, Mr. Trainer. Uh, Trainer, did he live there as well? Yeah. Yeah. So he's after. Yeah. So he was sometime not directly after Jerry Brown, but after. So yeah, it has a history. It's a really it's my, yeah, it's good. My first book I ever bought for interior design was that book. And it was wildly expensive at $40 for me at the time, but I, I made the slurge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. It's a really great reference. I mean, this is um, an amazing building. Um, yeah, so it's just something, and I think you can Google it and you'll see all these images. In fact, um, John Dickinson's uh, collection from this residence was an auction maybe a couple years ago. I saw these phrenology heads. Um, at auction, I think they were asking maybe 10,000 for the pair. Um, but yeah, they were just found objects at the time, right? So it's really amazing. Um, I think looking at openings, um, how uh, openings and separation. I, you know, on the left is a, the Spanish revival project again. And on the right is just a Victorian image I found online, but it's certainly something that the idea of, of how do you separate and define spaces, whether or not it's through building something solid or transparent, but using fabric, um, I find it really interesting. And so that's what we did uh, on the left uh, in this multi-functional space. It was for media, for play, for exercise for both adults and for kids in this one residence. And um, yeah, I just think the idea of using fabric as, you know, as a decorator for architecture is really interesting and blends the two together. Um, the idea of enclosures and surfaces um walls ceilings and roofs um i've always been really fascinated with what that surface might be or what you know what uh what um what these elements that you consider to enclose and protect yourself from shelter what how they affect the environment um and hanging things and whether it's fabric and hanging things off of it to make it feel like a wall or traditionally you know mirror is glass but you know so is also a lacquered finish um like on a ceiling i think um really is an interesting interesting way to finish a room but also very architectural um and on the left you might recognize as our showcase from last year um i look at composition and layout. Um, I think, you know, when you're approaching a space uh, and you see a fireplace, a lot of people say, okay, let's put two sofas there or let's put a pair of something there. Um, but I think if you look at the architecture and how you move through it, um, those are actually other conditions that might lend yourself to a layout or a composition of the furniture. On the right is a summer house um, in Finland by uh, Eli Saarinen, whose son you guys probably know is Eros Saarinen, who did the TWA terminal and the furniture that Mel represent or builds uh, manufacturers. But this summer house, I've always been really fascinated with how the rug turns into the upholstery and um, the color that's used and the, how it just uh, follows the wall itself. So that actually was actually a good inspiration for this project in Silicon Valley on the left, um, our Silicon Valley pied -a terre where if you look on our website and the project, uh, the upholstery in the bedroom and in the main space in the living room, that's all rugs. Um, it's just, yeah, I thought it was really fascinating how, how it was done in the summer house. Um, you look at details. Details can come from anywhere, actually. You just like look at things that are built. You look at, um, you observe how Jennifer Aniston's Prada dress and this buckle can be used for your curtains, like at the showcase. Um, just those little details themselves begin to um, 
add visual interest to your room as well. And I think as a designer, whether or not you share it with your client, for me, it's always helpful to think of a narrative and how you're designing a, a space or a project. Who is that end user? What could this be about? And that's your own story. It, it could be the story about the client and maybe that's how you relate to the client. Um, doesn't always have to be. In this case though, uh, the left is our San Francisco residence and the client herself had an appreciation for textiles. I always envisioned then this house being about a studio, an artist studio, a weaver um, who creates art three-dimensionally. And I looked at, um, I always imagine someone like um, Sheila Hicks, a contemporary artist who's down at this, on the lower right-hand corner in a space, I think she, an installation for the Centre Pompidou in Paris. Um, you could look her up and she has incredible work. Uh, she's still alive and her life has always been about weaving and text and, and, and fiber, um, just fascinating. So she was sort of my narrative for this project. We designed uh, the project as a collection of textiles, maybe that a workroom was creating um, and maybe something that this person who lives there might have inherited or might be passing along to her family. And so we came up with a series of, of rugs that would be highlighted in the rooms. Um, and then lastly, circulation and movement through space. Always looking about at how space is um, um, interpreted, uh, how you can create space with furniture and with um, furnishings. Um, the right is the John Teledino project. I really am fascinated with his idea of tapestries and um, whether they're found or whether he makes them and how they become part of the whole room. And on the left is our the entry of our Spanish Revival project and that movement through the openings in the hallway, in the entry hallway. And we made it, we in fact actually designed that tapestry that's also there. Um, so I guess in the end, what I would say is, you know, be open to the possibilities, be open to chance. Um, it's good to have goals. It's, um, but you don't have to have a 10 year goal, a 10 year, a 10 year plan. Right. Um, and I guess use your intuition and your judgment as part of your tools to guide you. I love that. Um, I really, the, the narrative that you create for each client, I totally resonate with that. Um, one of like the most important things for when people apply to decorator showcase is that you create the story behind the person that's living in the space. And I think that's what makes Decorator Showcase so fun is you don't have the constraints of the client. Like you can just make something up. Um, I, find I, that also... I found that very difficult, actually. <laughs> I did. I mean, I'm so used to dealing with clients. I like, okay, well, this is a space. Like on the one hand, I mean, the showcase is great for that reason, but on the other hand, you want to get the room and you're like, okay, well, what's going to resonate with trying to get, you know, what will help you get that room, right? And, um, and so you're sort of like in this conundrum, what is that narrative gonna be? But yeah, exactly. I mean, in that case though, you are really open and you, it does test your creativity. Like what is that narrative gonna be to help you? Yeah. And then I love the Jen Aniston um, inspiration because it also reminds me of John Dickinson and you're gonna correct me because I might be in the wrong demographic but he did a fabulous house for a family in Atherton that was also in Diane Dorian Sake's book. And the way that you did those window coverings is very reminiscent of what he did in the bathroom there. So- Oh, oh that was- um, Who was that? that? I've heard- That residence was, I remember maybe- And it went to auction. Like yes, exactly. A couple exactly. of years ago. Exactly, exactly. I think that was at Bonham's. Yes. 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 Kendra, Kendra would probably know. She's researching it right now. I can see it in her eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about that house until it went up for auction. The the contents went up for auction. Then I looked was at that. It, oh, that was the one where Diane Sakes did the. the yes. Talk. Yes. Oh. Yeah. 
Okay. Oh, it was Palo Alto. It was not Atherton. It was a Palo Alto home. Yes, exactly. That one was fun exactly. and beautiful. Um, and I, I do like you, you have a, a storyline about like women in architecture. So I think one of the things that's interesting about you as a firm is one, you're incredibly cerebral and we'll send out a certificate to everybody who's been in this um, lecture. <laughs> and you should absolutely be a college professor um, <laughs> that's kind of you <laughs> um so <laughs> so Callie has a, I'm going to do some praise and then Callie has a question for you so uh Sabrina says so much inspiration and informative thank you so much Mar Mariana says you are so talented Thank you so much for sharing your story and why it says beautiful work, leaving this presentation, feeling very inspired. Thank you. Thank um, you. And I was a little bit late to the conversation. Um, so I'm sorry that I held this up, but I felt like it was so worth the time. Um, Callie asked, what do you look for in a client project at this point in your career? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think, what I look for in a client project has also been what I looked at, looked for when I started Martin Young Design. I started the company knowing that I wanted to stay, stay small. I think one of the criticisms of working in a large office was um, clients would not get FaceTime with the principal. That, that's why they would hire the office. And so I think to Chris's point, you're giving so much of yourself um, you're not always getting the credit. I think um, I thought and still feel like, uh, A, you know, I enjoy engaging with the client. Um, I basically was doing the projects at these larger offices. Um, and I think engaging with people has always been what I love. So my intent was always to stay small so I could have that engagement and um, not run a 90 person office and have my hands in everything and only have five minutes for each project. Um, so what I look for is a client who's engaged, who is willing to put the collaborative effort into it. Sometimes, they're, sometimes collaboration means, okay, you do it and I trust what you're doing. Um, other times it means having um, a text or a telephone call or a presentation on a weekend or in your off hour, um, but they're engaged. They wanna know, they're thinking, well, what if we do this? What does it look like? Well, what if we do that? What does it look like? So that spectrum can range, but they are engaged. And I mean it in the sense that as opposed to um, not liking something, always wanting something different. I think that's very different. That's what I experienced in a lot of projects in a, lar in a large office. Um, I look for projects that and clients um, as a small office, you rely on referral. So you want to look for clients who have that network that are um, you think um, you don't know for sure until you actually work with them, but you that will be able to refer you or have a, a base to refer you to, um, especially if you want to stay small and your pipeline only needs to be maybe four or five projects at a time. Um, you want to make sure you get those quality projects. Um, and then another consideration is maybe they don't have that network, but maybe it'll be a great project because they're a great person. Um, maybe they don't have that network, but it'll be a great project and they'll let you publish it. And those are sort of other qualities you want to look for or that I look for in taking on projects. Um, does that, I think that answers the question. I think it does. So um, if my team wants to take your 102 course, because we just finished 101, <laughs> how can they reach out to you? <laughs> um, well, I work directly with Kendra, Natalia, and Trisha, and sometimes with Krista. So you always reach out to them and, and to get me. Um, I have, we, Trisha has made um, a wonderful website did I mention Trisha? I work with directly with Trisha too. Um, Trisha has made a wonderful website. You can always get us through the website. And um, and so you... your direct email is martin at martinyoungdesign.com. That's correct. That's correct. 
So any questions for Martin? If you want to take his 102 course, <laughs> <laughs> reach out and send him an email. But as you can see from today, he's an incredibly talented designer and incredibly cerebral. And I always learn so much when we're chatting together. No, thank you. Thank you guys for um, letting me do this. It's been wonderful. Any <laughs> final questions? Going once, going twice. I think Julia and Martin could nerd out for like hours. <laughs> <laughs> Julia says, says love, sent you a heart. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Julia. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. And it's just, it's been lovely to connect with you. Thank you guys for, for allowing me to do this. It's been wonderful. Oh my gosh. And we'll send you the recording so you'll have it. And then we also use it um, for uh, recruiting too. So when we hire somebody on, they can learn a little bit about you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I All right. We'll it. have a wonderful Monday. Have a really great catching up. week, all of you. Thank you. You too. Yeah. Take Thank care. You. Talk bye -bye. to everybody soon. Bye.